one to today's talk, getting out the intersectional vote, Latinx voters, and grassroots power building. I am Teresa Acuña, Associ Associate Director of Democratic Governance Programs at the Ash Center. If this is your first time joining us, the Ash Center is one of 12 research think tanks at the Harvard Kennedy School. And among the many things we do, we focus on bridging academia and practice to improve our democracy. I want to start us off with a few housekeeping announcements. First, I want to thank you in advance for your patience for any technical issues we may encounter today. To minimize ambient noise, the audience is muted, but we encourage you to use the chat box for questions or comments throughout the conversation. We will dedicate the last 15 to 20 minutes of our time together for audience questions where we will unmute you. But if you have any questions or, or, or comments throughout the presentation, you should feel free to use the chat box to send them. This event is being recorded and could be found on the Ash Center website for future viewing. And today's conversation is part of a series exploring voting, voters, and voting behavior. Because one measure of the health of a democracy is the levels to which citizens are participating. There are 60 million Latinos living in the United States. And in 2020, there will be 33 million Latinx voters in the country, making them the second largest voting bloc. Participation of Latinx voters can lead to dramatic shifts in the type of leaders that are elected, and their policy priorities. Yet there's great diversity among the Latinx community and this is shown in their voting behavior. With little more than seven months till the general presidential election, we explore the work that remains to make sure Latinx voters make it to the polls. And to help us delve into the many questions we have about Latinx voters and grassroots organizing, I welcome our guests, Cristina Beltran and Antonio Arreano, Profesora, Profe, uh, uh, Cristina Beltran works at the intersection of Latinx politics and political theory. She's an associate professor and director of graduate studies in the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis at New York University. She is the author of The Trouble with Unity, Latino Politics and the Creation of Identity, a nuanced critique of civic Latinidad and the Latino electoral and pro protest politics that work to erase diversity and debate in favor for images of commonality. Welcome, Cristina. Hi, thanks for having me. Also joining us is Antonio Arrellano, Interim Executive Director at Jolt Action, a Texas-based organization that is harnessing the power of Latino culture to empower young Latinos and transform Texas. Antonio is a multimedia journalist and human rights advocate. He uses his platforms to engage thousands of millennials and empower youth to fight for immigration reform, racial equality, LGBTQI issues, and civil rights. Welcome, Antonio. Hola, Teresa. Thank you so much for letting me be a part of this. Again, thank you for joining us. Um, I want to remind our audience to get involved and help us impact today's topic by typing your questions or comments in the chat box. Um, I'm hoping that we can... Um, talk in two parts today. Um, first, laying some foundation uh, about the Latinx voter, and then move into a conversation about the current realities we are facing, um, that we will likely hold an election in the middle of a pandemic, and it will influence the issues and perhaps the candidates, Latinx voters, um, will show up to support or not support. So uh, a question I have for both of you, um, to start us off with is the Latinx community is often seen as a monolith. Uh, the Latino vote is used as a label meant to reflect the voting behavior of many, many people. What do you wish others understood of the intersectional experience of the Latinx community? And how does this translate to them as voters? Um, and Cristina, your book, The Problem with Unity speaks to this. Perhaps you can start us off. Um, sure. Well, again, thanks again, uh, Teresa, for having me, and thanks for folks like um, 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 Megan, Francis, for inviting me, and it's just a pleasure to talk to folks at the Ash Center, so thanks. Um, so yeah, I think that the hardest thing is that I think if I think of one, I think the title of this is really important, the fact that you're using the language of intersectionality, because if there's anything that drives me nuts is that we say the Latino vote in a way that we would never say the white vote, right? we would never treat white voting populations with such simplistic flat 
depictions. We always talk about Democrats, Republicans, um, suburban voters. So the minute we're talking about white voters, we're always talking about, um, you know, um, party, region, ideology. And I just think it's incredibly important that we do the same thing with Latino voters. So I think it's important that I think folks in the media and the public realm really acknowledge the fact that we need to avoid making gross generalizations. In fact, I would sort of argue, I think it's not even that helpful to say the Latino community as much as there are Latino communities. Um, and they have overlaps and solidarities and connections, but they are in some ways really importantly distinct communities. And you know, there's a difference as we talk about the Latino electorate, we need to think really hard and have outreach strategies that acknowledge that there are Latino rural voters, there's urban voters, college educated voters, union voters, activist voters, um, first time voters, older married voters, suburban voters, evangelicals, queer Latinx voters. So we have a lot of different populations and a lot of different communities and they overlap in important and interesting ways, but we need to get better at describing and talking about the specificity of these distinctions so that we can come up with voter strategies because if we don't, then we start making really gross generalizations. Like um, the one I really hate is when we say, um, you know, Latinos don't vote. And that just, I think that's such an insult to the, to the generations of activists that have been fighting to create, I mean, millions of Latinos vote every year, every election. And we have lots of new people who need to be brought into the process, but we need to have a conversation that's capable of talking about the many people who need to be brought in and the many people who have been organizing on the ground for generations um, who've made spaces for, um, for Latino political participation. And so I think that we just need to get much more careful about talking about you know, the gender gap in Latino voting, uh, region, religion, all these questions um, so that we talk about Latinos the way we talk about white voters, frankly, the way we talk about other populations in less simplistic ways. So that's my big, that's both my beef and my hope. <laughs> Can't hear you. Teresa, I think your mic is muted or was. Hello? I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. Antonio, same question. Yeah, so you know, in, in regards to the monolith uh, and referring to the Latinx folks, you know, that couldn't be further from the truth. We're not a monolith at all. You know, what um, what people, what I would like people to understand is that the Latinx community is culturally, idealistically, and linguistically diverse. And Cristina's absolutely right. In order for us to really tap into this untapped gold mine of potential that exists within the Latinos, um, we've got to start creating strategies uh, around the different components that make up our existence, right? And we're seeing this diversity only expand in the next coming years as the, the, the Latino electorate becomes increasingly much younger, it becomes even more diverse, right? There's generations of Latinos in America now that are third, fourth generation um, um, Americans. And so many of them identify with parts of uh, their Latinidad or the Latino culture and heritage from Latin American countries um, like, you know, Mexico, Honduras, El Salvador, et cetera. But many of them also have grown up singing the Star Spangled Banner, pledging allegiance to America. They are, you know, they know baseball just as much as anybody else. They follow football just as closely as anybody else. And so there's really a, um, a untapped potential here to really understand um, the Latinx community. And what's happened is that there has been a lack of investment. You know, when people say Latinos don't vote, what they're really saying is they haven't invested in engaging the Latino electorate. Because at JOLT, what we do is we specifically focus on targeting low propensity voters, communities of voters that have either never voted before or that strategists tell us are likely not to vote. We go into neighborhoods that strategists tell us you're wasting your money, why are you going there? Those people don't come out, but we go there specifically for that reason. Because there has been a historic and strategic 
underinvestment in our Latinos communities and the lack of resources, the lack of education, the lack of engagement has resulted in a lack of participation. But just like any other constituency, if you believe in their potential, if you begin to invest in their infrastructure and develop the foundation needed to mobilize them, you will then spark interest in the political process. You will spark participation. And here's the thing, what you noted at the beginning of this, which is very accurate, the power of the Latino electorate is growing to a, in numbers that soon will be insurmountable. You will not be able to win the White House without the Latinx vote. And it's crucial that in this point of growth, everybody in this country starts to recognize the full potential and power that exists within the Latino community. You know, in the recent years, we have seen um, this administration go after Latinos and attack them head on dehumanizing them, discriminating against them. Um, and what we tell our members at JOLT is the reason you are under attack, the reason you are being dehumanized and discriminated against is because you are so powerful. It's because you're the biggest threat to the status quo. See, the birds pick at the best fruit. And right now, Latinos are on the verge of, of, of truly transforming this country. And what we tell our members is, do not be discouraged by these attacks. Recognize your full power and potential and start utilizing, not just decide the next presidential election, but to start pushing forward the type of legislation that you want to see enacted in this country. You see, with what we're, what we're undergoing is a mental switch. And at Jolt, what we're trying to do is change minds. We don't do voter registration campaigns. We do what's called culture shifting campaigns. We want Latinos to recognize that though we have been called minorities for most of our lifetime, we've been referred to as a minority over and over again. We need them to realize that soon they will be the majority. And that with that comes a lot of political power and that they start to, they need to start seeing themselves as a majority. Because when you grow up seeing yourselves as a minority, that allows you to believe that you are worth less, that you deserve less. And when you start recognizing your full capacity, start believing in your full potential and start behaving as the majority of the population of this country, you will then not only transform Texas or California, you will transform America. Great, wow, thank you. There's, there's a lot um, that you touched on that I'm hoping that we can return to specifically around the vest investments or lack thereof um, for voters. But um, I'll move on to, to my next question. According to the Pew Research Center poll, 71% of Latinx voters say the government should do more to solve problems, lending credence that Latinx voters are policy forward voters. They show up to support ideas. In both of your experience, what is the policy proposals the Latinx community supports? Or where is their divergence in the community? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think one thing that's really going to be important this year is this is, I mean, we don't know how COVID-19 and how the coronavirus, how this is going to, this is going to be an election so shaped by this. And, and I think that relates to a lot of the issues of, um, that, um, that were raised, that, um, that Mr. Arellano raised about um, sort of the underinvestment in these communities, because our communities are being hardest hit by this, by this virus, right? So our communities that are, um, you know, um, immigrant communities, a lot of people who are essential workers working in grocery stores as delivery drivers, restaurant workers, so many of um, a disproportionate number of our population is being both exposed and not protected. Um, and some of the recent legislation that's come through to protect um, or to support Americans through this, um, through the, through the COVID-19 crisis are not assisting non-citizens, especially the undocumented, even though they're paying into um, social security, even though they are at the front lines of this and they need protective gear, they need, they need enormous amounts of support. So, um, so I think that that issue alone, I think there's so many issues that have been ongoing issues around how our communities are under supported and under resourced and our working class populations. This is going to, I think, become a really um, even more dire situation and something that a lot of people are going to um, want to, you know, put themselves out there in terms of the vote for. But Latinos, I mean, it's important to realize, I want to make a couple of quick points about this because I think it's really important to realize that Latino voters um, are deeply concerned about issues like immigration, but often get targeted or get described as if that's the main issue they care about. Um, and it really varies. And it's important to realize, of course, that 
it varies for voters because there's a difference between, there's 60 million Latinos in the United States. About 33 are eligible voters, which means that the voting population are citizens. So the question of citizenship is a really important question for Latino voters and, uh, and Latinx communities in general, but it has a different level of intensity depending on the voter in part because everybody who's a voter is a citizen, right? Um, so, so that's an issue that's really interesting. And so you have a lot of uh, Latinx voters who I think these issues have become much more salient to them because of the attacks on, on migrants for the last three years, especially, but over the last 20 years. So this has become a really politicized issue for a lot of Latinx voters. There's also a portion of Latinx voters who don't necessarily identify with migrants, um, who are third and fourth generation uh, voters who don't really see much of a connection to themselves and immigrants, who don't really have a sense of solidarity. So of that sort of 65 to 70% of Latinos who are Democrats, you have a consistent 25% of, of Latinx voters who are Republican, who are conservative. Um, who might vote more because they're evangelicals or because they are um, uh, have other kinds of issues, small business owners who um, maybe aren't supportive of, of certain kinds of progressive policies. So we need to be clear that um, the turnout of, Lat of Latinx populations will definitely support democratic politics in general, especially younger voters, millennial voters, Generation Z voters, but it's not going to be a case in which uh, Latinx voters um, are simply a kind of um, Sanders wave of voters. I, that would be my dream personally, ideologically based on my politics, but, but the reality is a much more diverse electorate, which means we have to have different strategies for mobilizing different segments of the population. But, but I think so many of the issues that Latinx voters worry about, education, economic inequality, labor rights, healthcare, issues that have always mattered in these communities are gonna matter even more now with COVID-19 because all of these issues um, are heightened in all kinds of ways. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Antonio? Yeah, and you know, Christina, you're absolutely right. And I'll just add, you know, here at Jolt, we recently conducted a study that's called the We Are Texas Report. It's available for free download on our website at joltinitiative.org. And in that study, we did a deep dive into identifying what young Latinos, particularly the young Latino electorate really care about, right? The core issues. And so I'm really glad that you brought this question up, Teresa, because it's important that as we move forward and try to say, you know, we're building the infrastructure of Latino participation, we want to get them engaged. It's important that we have a cohesive message as to what are the core issues here? What are the core um, um, voting motivators that are going to drive Latinos out, right? And so what we've done is we've narrowed it down to a couple of, of key issues. Number one issue, top of mind for young Latino voters is healthcare for all. As Latinos in the state of Texas, the state leads the nation with the largest percentage of uninsured um, populations in the country. And out of those, the biggest block of uninsured are Latinos. And that's, that's um, the same across the country. So what we're seeing here is that young Latinos are watching grandma and grandpa, dad and mom die because of their lack of access to affordable health care. They can't get the medical attention that they need to deal with terminal illnesses that they that they have. And so they're passionate about making sure that our, our medical system is reformed and that our health care system is reformed. We cannot continue to uh, move forward um, without addressing the disparities that exist within this um, the system. And you're seeing it right now more than ever before with COVID, right? We're seeing that communities of color, Latinx communities, Black communities are have the highest percentage of COVID cases. And that's largely in part because of our lack of access to medical treatment and medical uh, uh, affordable uh, medical health care. And so what we'll see here is come November, this will be top of mind, already is top of mind, Prior to COVID-19, folks were already struggling with um, getting the, the, the medical attention that they needed, and now even more so. So if you want to engage Latinos, if you want to mobilize this electorate, you need to start talking about how we're going to create uh, equality and equity within the, uh, the medical and healthcare programs that our country currently has, and how we can innovate that to incorporate Latinos in a way that they no longer have to be fearful about getting or seeking medical treatment. Number two, the number two issue is immigration. You know, Christina is absolutely right. Immigration is near and dear to our hearts. Most of us are either immigrants or children of immigrants in some way or another. And so when we, what we've seen here is a rampant attack on immigrant communities, immigrant 
households. And those who are American citizens uh, who have a direct connection to their immigrant heritage see this as an attack on their families. And what's really important to recognize is that Latinos are very family focused. And so when you would come after our families, you're coming after us and we will vote you out. It's as simple as that. And so we want to make sure that folks recognize that immigration is still near and dear. It's not number one, though. It's number two. And so Christina is absolutely right. When we have candidates coming into a Latino or Latinx majority communities and all they do is talk about immigration for 30 minutes, they're missing the mark. They need to recognize that there's other topics and other subject matters that we also want to be a part of. And don't just come and speak to us about the issue. Incorporate us, incorporate us in the solution. You know, we believe that as the people who are directly affected and impacted by this, we have within our capacity, the ability to begin to architect the solutions to our country's biggest problems. Bring us to the decision making table, incorporate Latina women at the decision making table. You know, when we talk about the wage gap and and across the country, it's women make less than men, and then white women make less and then Black women make less than white women, and then Latina women make less than white women and black women. So what we have to really address here is the the these massive gaps that exist and how even at the end of the totem pole, we're still getting the short end of the, of the stick and our women are getting the short end of the stick. And so in order to really transform this country, we need to make sure that we're putting female leadership front and center and addressing these issues with them at the decision-making table. And number three is racial equity. You see, in our in our country, uh, we have we, we have a problem with addressing the, the racist sentiment that has existed since our founding, right? And what we see here is in Texas, you don't have to tell young Latinos or Latinas about racism. They know it because they're experiencing it firsthand. It was just last fall that you saw a man drive from Dallas to El Paso to shoot Mexicans at a Walmart, you know? And so what we're seeing here at Jolt is we're thinking about how do we innovate the civic engagement process in this country? because let me tell you something. America is founded, its democracy is founded on two core elements. The bread and butter of democracy in America is phone banking and block walking. Get a group of people, go knock on doors, get a group of people and make some calls. That structure, that model was created with one sector of the voting population in mind, middle-class white voters. That same that same st strategy does not work across the board. And if you think you can go into a Latino majority neighborhood, knock on my grandma's door, and she's going to answer and have a conversation with you, you're sadly mistaken. You have to recognize that our communities are being terrorized. They're not opening the door to just anybody, particularly someone who doesn't look like them or sound like them. And so what we're doing is we're innovating the way that we connect with our electoral, our Latino electorate. One of the ways that we're doing that is through programs like Poder Quince. Jolt is the only organization in the country that's doing voter registration at quinceañeras. There's an estimated 50,000 quinceañeras happening in Texas alone every year. Nobody's connecting or talking to our communities there. So what we're doing is we're providing a service. We provide a free photo booth because everybody wants to take a photo with La Quinceañera. So we provide the free photo booth at the event with the only uh, exception that you allow us to do voter registration of the guests who want to register to vote or are eligible to vote on the spot, on site. We register them right away. And what we're doing is we're putting the power in the quinceañera's hands. We're telling these young women, we prepare every quinceañera to give a passionate speech at their event where they call on their guests and they say, I pledge that when I am of age, I will vote to defend my community and my family. And I call on you, my friends and family here tonight who are eligible to vote, let your power and your gift to me tonight be your registration to vote. And you see aunts and uncles, grandmas and grandpas, people that have never even talked about politics before, get up and go register. And the reason they're doing that is because uh, uh, statistics indicate that you're more likely to register to vote if you're asked by a friend or a family member, as opposed to a, a random person on the street that shows up at your door. And so what we're doing is we're doing two things, innovating the way the Latinos get engaged in the political process and putting the power in the hands of young Latina women, because at the end of the day, it'll be young Latinas who will write the next chapter of American history. No, I, can I just throw something in? Cause I, I love Poder Quince. I think that's just such an amazing idea. Like, and I think it really, I just, I think it really just gets Antonio's point. And I think, you know, I think we need to be really clear about how terrifying the thought is to um, Republicans for presidential politics when Texas goes blue, right? The point in which Texas and California are reliably democratic states, if and when that happens, that is a terrifying 
um, that is sort of the end of, um, of, of, um, of a certain kind of competitive presidential politics for a lot of these, these folks. They'd have to really change their strategies and their, and their message um, once and if that happens, right? So, and I think it is a question of if rather than, um, a when rather than if. Um, but I think that just to underscore what Antonio is saying, I think that um, what groups like JOLT are doing is so key is that it is, there is so much political creativity in our communities and so much political um, imagination and creativity and ideas. And they, that has not been, um, you know, neither political party has in any way um, respected or taken advantage of that. And I think that's, and so we're doing it ourselves and you see that creativity happening in communities and it's been happening for generations. Like I said, you can go back and look at what people were doing in Crystal City um, in the Chicano movement, trying to um, transform voting um, in places like that. So there's a long history here that we should be more aware of and think about, but, but that creativity is what I think is going to not only lead in terms of Latinx voters um, doing, doing better, but it's going to really be a model for uh, uh, you know, grabbing other kinds of young voters you know, why aren't, why aren't there voter registration things happening at proms across the nation, right? Like there's so many sites where we don't, I'm always like, why aren't there voter registration tables in front of every Sephora in the country, right? Like, oh my God, like, you know, why are we, why are we so um, sort of just stuck in old patterns of thinking in terms of, you know, every, every like, you know, in barrios across the country, Taqueria should have voter reg you know, programs happening in front of all sorts of spaces, um, you know, when you're getting your car lubed or, you know, there's just so many sites where we should be, we should be present and helping people. You know, one thing I always say when I teach is that there are so many opportunities to be a consumer in our culture, right? Global capitalism, even now that I'm stuck at home, I'm still being continually invited to purchase things, to, to, to be a consumer. But what we're rarely invited to do is to be citizens to be civically active, to be politically engaged. And we need to be as um, creative in our thinking about how we get people to be civic as we are of how we get them to be consumers, right? We need to just be much more creative in the ways we do this. And, um, and I think groups like JOLT are just really modeling something that is just makes me much more hopeful about, um, about the future of, of voting populations. But we're also really disadvantaged by the structures. So I hope that's something we can talk about too. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Yes, we will. We will definitely um, make it a point to, to talk about that a little bit more. Um, my next question is for both of you. Bernie Sanders made significant investments um, in reaching the Latinx voter community early and consistently. This looked to pay off in some states like Nevada and California. Um, I was even encouraged when I went to Iowa for the caucuses, um, a state that has a little over 5% uh, Latinos, um, they had a dedicated Latinx voter outreach person, a paid staffer on the campaign who spoke to them. On caucus night, in the specific caucus that I was at in Marshalltown, which has a large Latino population, mostly due because of the agriculture in the area, um, it seemed to pay off people showed up not to caucus but to support bernie sanders for president and why do you think more candidates are not making similar investments to reach latinx voters when what i'm seeing is a men a, a grand um sense of loyalty from them i dare you i'll let antonio start because i just talked for a bit so i can i'll turn it <laughs> Thank you, Christina. That's a great question, Teresa. And it's a question that has puzzled us too. Like, why are you not investing in Latinos, right? And so here's the thing. So in order to answer that question, we got to look at the process, right? So a couple of things. One, traditional candidates in America see Latino outreach as two things. One, I will release a Spanish commercial. And two, I will Google translate my website to Spanish. Y ahí está. I did my Google, my, my Latino outreach. Why they're not coming out, I have no idea, you know? And so what we need to recognize here is that there's a lack of true and genuine outreach happening, right? And so what we're seeing with the Bernie Sanders campaign, which uh, props to Solidary Strategies, who's, who led their Latino outreach um, 
infrastructure is that they tapped into it in a different way. They branded him Theo Bernie. They did marketing and branding across the board to make sure that it was culturally relevant to Latinos. Okay. And so that's what's important. The word culturally relevant, culturally um, 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 identifiable campaigns are what's going to be cru crucial, you know, and I'll tie this into to Petra's question here that she says, you know, on, on the chat, it says the, the Latinos have been the sleeping giant. What can we do to get them out, why, to bring them out to the polls? And that's what the Sanders campaign did is they started to innovate the way that they reach out to Latinos by making sure that they're connecting at a more at a deeper level, not just by putting out a bumper sticker in Spanish, but by really identifying what are, what are the key traits that make the Latino electric ele electorate tick. How do I get them out to vote? How do I get them connected to me? And when you become more genuine in your outreach, even by, like you said, you know, Teresa, by putting people in positions of power that look like us within your team, hiring culturally competent staff, right? Not a, a, a white strategist that's telling you, oh, this is how you're gonna reach Latinos, spend you know a, a, a half a million dollars on, on Univision and Telemundo Airwaves and call it, a, call it a day, but actually strategizing as to how are we gonna talk to LGBTQ Latinos? How are we gonna talk to Afro-Latinx folks? How are we gonna talk to Latina moms? How are we gonna, et cetera, you know? Breaking down the segments of our existence and our population is crucial. Hiring that culturally competent team is essential. And what you saw in the Sanders campaign is that they made incredible headway because they began to do that. And what we're starting to see is a pivot from candidates that are starting to recognize, oh, I can't win without Latinos. I can't win without having a strategy for Latinos, right? And so the other thing is that I think it's important that what we preach here at Jolt is that you don't just say, oh, I stand in solidarity with Latinos. I believe in fight for your causes, but you actually have an action plan to address our issues. Don't just say, I stand in solidarity with immigrants, but have a hundred day plan for comprehensive immigration reform with a pathway to citizenship that is actually doable, ac that's actionable, right? Because we have seen since Ronald Reagan, the, the hundred day promise of comprehensive immigration reform from Bill Clinton to Barack Obama and every president in between has said that. But we here are, we are here now in 2020 with the same, uh, Joe Biden probably running on the same platform of issuing comprehensive immigration reform, which now Latinos are skeptical about. Like, okay, both political parties have lied essentially and under delivered on this one essential promise. And so what we need is tangible, physical evidence of what it is step by step that you will do to get us to that point, to get us to that deadline, right? And the other thing is what we see here in Texas, and I can't talk for the country at large on this, but what we see here in Texas is what often happens is candidates don't prioritize Latinos until the the, the end stretch of it. So it's like campaign, campaign, campaign all through the primary. And then you're three months out from the general election. And you're like, where do I find extra voters to get me across the finish line? Oh, I can tap into these 200,000 Latinos. Let me run some Spanish ads. That is not three months, six months is not enough time to galvanize and energize and incentivize Latinos to come out to vote. You have got to start putting Latinos at the front and center of your policy making from the very get go, from the very beginning. And that's what we want to, what we want to to get across to candidates is you have to have a policy and 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 plan for Latino issues from the very beginning of your campaign. Prioritize us because soon you will realize, particularly after the census, you will realize that our numbers in this country are so so substantial that you cannot win without tapping into us. And so, in order for us to really get um, more candidates on board, we will have to see them start to hire culturally confident staff, develop policies and procedures specifically for us, have platforms specifically speaking to us, and then make sure that that it's genuine. It's got to be a genuine outreach. You cannot be trying to pretend like you care. You have to actually care and because because Latinos will see right through that. And when when you make those efforts, when you make that connection, you will win the loyalty of the Latino electorate. And Cristina is absolutely right. What, 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 what we see in the Latino electorate is a, a constituency that once you captivate them, they're yours for generations. And so this is true for either political party. And I know that it sounds crazy right now, given the political climate, but either political party that taps into this will win the Latino electorate for generations to come. Yeah, I mean, I think I think one of the issues um, that that I think the Bernie Sanders campaign was so good at is a lot of the things Antonio was saying. I think they they um, they mobilized organizers on the ground. They they were there. There are already 
one thing that I, there's a couple of things I think are important here. One of them I think is that um, I remember realizing and talking to some people who were like election strategist people and realizing like I teach democratic theory. So like I have, you know, I have an investment in social movements and democracy and growing our democracy and the importance of people, all the things the Ash Center is trying to do, right? Civically engage people that it's critically important that we are part of our political system that if you're not active in politics in this country, things will either be done to you or by you. Those are the only choices. Things will either happen to you or you will or you'll be a part of the decision making process. And when you opt out, you become a victim of a political system that knows you are a, a population that can be ignored. Right. So so political participation is both civically necessary. It's also, I think, a form of just literal self defense um, to, to protect yourself. Um, so I think that but that is not how campaigns tend to look at this. Campaigns don't think about democracy writ large. They think about elections as they want to win them. And they their focus is on winning elections. It's a very day trader kind of immediate focused candidate centered strategy. And I think oftentimes all they care about is winning the election. So if that means focusing all their resources on getting out people who are reliable voters, then they have limited funds and they go after the reliable voters. So when it comes to Latinos, they see that as an unreliable population that's gonna cost a lot of money and take a lot of time. And so they're not really committed to doing it. So they do a very you know, fundamentally half-assed job when it comes to Latinos. Um, and it reflects the lack of diversity in their organizations generally, um, all the things Antonio laid out, right? But I think that one thing you can see in different, in different um, elections historically, you see it with Beto's campaign, you see it um, in Texas for the Senate, you see it in Sanders' campaign, you saw it in 1988 and 84 with Jesse Jackson's campaign. When you have movement campaigns, campaigns that are actually committed to a, a certain kind of conception of democracy and political mobilization of the citizenry, of the people, of populations becoming part of the political system, they are willing to invest more in those practices. So what you need often is, um, you know, you need candidates, I think, who think about this in a, in a broader way. Um, nowadays, I think they have to just be self-interested as well. But I don't think self-interest will just get us across the finish line because, um, because of some of the structural disadvantages that Latinos have in the, in the electoral college, et cetera. But I think that we really have to, that is why it's so key to think about the groups like JOLT, groups like One Arizona. You know, there are organizations on the ground that care about democracy, right? And I think what, so I think one of the issues is also is that to empower our communities, we have to realize that it takes, it can take years to turn non-voters into voters. And so it takes an ongoing effort that neither party has been willing to invest in. So Latino civic organizations have taken it on themselves to do that work, but it takes years to turn non-voters into voters, right? You know, there might be somebody that you talk to in 2018 and try to mobilize them and talk to them and they might start thinking about it, but then they didn't do it because they didn't have childcare or they didn't. But then in the 2020 election, the memory of those conversations, the new outreach that's happened, then they're like, okay, this time it's, I'm gonna do it, right? But it takes, it takes effort and multiple touches, multiple outreaches. So it's, it's an ongoing investment that takes resources and years of organizing to create, to build an electorate. It's not, and so the fact that, you know, Antonio's point that most of these candidates grab one person and do it at the last minute and then, we, and then, and then complains and blames Latinos for not coming out in elections is this sort of cycle um, that I think we've seen that a lot of Latino political scientists have talked about. It's this ongoing cycle where every four years we're the new sleeping giant. And then every four years there's articles afterwards saying, oh, they disappointed us again. They didn't wake up. And it's, an, it's actually a really racist trope. Um, you know, one thing I always say, if I could just get people to stop saying sleeping giant, because I think, it, I think it's like illegal alien. I think it's actually a racist trope. And I know that Latinos use it in headlines for articles because it's so common. But what it assumes is that Latinos are this quiescent, it, 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 it calls to mind the Mexican sleeping under the cactus tree, right? It calls to mind this idea of us being uh, uh, not roused. Um, and it, it does a disservice to the political activism in our community. So if I can get anything for anybody watching this, never use that phrase ever again. It's a, it's a messed up racist trope. Um, we shouldn't be participating in it. Um, but I think that this idea though of cultural relevance, my last point about cultural relevance is I would just note that um, that's not a one, fits si one size fits all point. You know, the, the point that was made in the comments here about, 
you know, the kind of work you need to do to outreach, to reach out to Afro, that next communities, to trans communities, to queer communities, the culturally specific Latinx kind of mobilization for those communities is gonna be very different than the mobilization you might do to reach out to, um, you know, suburban Latina women who are, um, you know, 45 and older, right? The kind of culturally relevant um, outreach you do to her is going to be different than the kind of culturally out, you know, outreach you do to um, um, you know, 25 year old Latino men, um, you know, because they have different views around social democracy. They have different views around, you know, all kinds of questions. So you have to be, you know, are you trying to get somebody who's periodically voted for a Republican to vote for a Democrat? Or are you trying to get somebody who's a left-wing voter who thinks that both parties are corrupt and don't represent radical change? Like the culturally relevant strategy in those different communities has to be specific. Um, and so it's not just like, we'll show some mariachis, we'll do a Spanish ad, we'll say they were family and they'll all come out. Like those are the kinds of ways they've done it in the past and it's been a pretty big failure. So culture is a complicated category. It's not a simple category. And so we have to think about the strategies of mobilization around culture that are very targeted and specific and national origin specific, all kinds of things. And so that's that's just a really important element here too. Thank you, Christina. Um, and you know, I just wanna reflect a little bit on the term sleeping giant. Um, and I think that that's a, a really um, insightful way to be thinking about the, the phrase. Um, and so I think that I commit to stop using it myself. So yeah. thanks for that. <laughs> um, I think it's a great segue, what you both have talked about um, to my next question. And I'm gonna lump two questions together so we have enough time for our audience. Um, one, one aspect of the question is, what does Vice President Biden, the presumed Democratic nominee, have to do to court young Latinx voters who fervently back Senator Sanders? And, and the second part to that is um, we are seeing something really amazing, the power and the role that young voters have in their households as trusted messengers and as motivated um, um, citizens to not only get themselves to vote, but perhaps it's their entire household and perhaps it's their neighborhoods and entire communities. Um, can both of you reflect on those two those two questions? So um, path for, for Biden in courting um, Latino voters and then um, youth taking on this very important role. Um, Antonio, so, do you wanna start us off? Yeah, yeah, I'll start us off. Thank you, Teresa. Um, you know, I think President or Vice President Biden has a massive, you know, a goal here, and that's to, um, in one way, rekindle the relationship with the Latino constituency, and in another way, create enthusiasm um, behind his campaign. So, I, I, you know, going back to the Sanders campaign, I, I think you're absolutely right that they created a lot of excitement, and even Cristina referred to it as a movement-led, you know, movement-esque. Um, sort of campaign. And we really see the lack of in the vice president's campaign. And so I think that they have got to, as a matter of fact, the day that um, uh, Senator Sanders endorsed, uh, uh, dropped out, and then subsequently endorsed Vice President Biden, I immediately got on a phone call with my friends and, and some colleagues. And I said, Biden has got to immediately course correct and start reaching out to Latinos because you saw it in Nevada, you saw it here in Texas where he lost the entire RGB. Latinos are not as excited or connecting with his campaign. And if he does not do this within the next couple of months, it could cost him the election. I mean, it really could cost him the election regardless of how many attacks President Trump does on the Latinos. If you do not provide a picture of opportunity and solutions to our problems, we're not gonna come out and vote for you just because you're not Donald Trump. Even, even though that, that might be the mindset, like, oh, well, you know, they're gonna come out no matter what. But the thing is that you can't take us for granted. You gotta literally put forward how you're going to recreate um, um, a, an infrastructure in this country or create an infrastructure in this country that will prioritize us. Now, the other thing with Vice President Biden is that I think hurt him is that a lot of our families are still reeling from the Obama immigration 
uh, challenges that his administration faced, and 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 rightfully so. There's still a lot of families that were that were directly impacted and are separated. You know, um, somebody online the other day told me, you know, well, well, you know, that that's in the past. We need to get behind him and just like settle it, like get, get over it. And I said, well, you you tried telling people that can't see their mom or their dad because they got deported under the Obama administration to just get over it and get behind Biden. It's not it's not going to be that easy. There needs to be some real relationship building, some real amending of the relationship there that has to be genuine and come from his heart. Now, number two is about the power of young Latinx voters. I mean, that's what excites me. That's the core of Jolt is mobilizing young Latinx voters. And the reason that we're so um, focused on this key constituency is because we genuinely believe it's not the future, it's the right now. We've grown up hearing that in the future, Latinos are going to be great, that in the future, Latinos are going to be unstoppable. Jolt is here to tell you that the future has arrived and that the power and the potential that young Latinos have right now can truly transform politics and democracy in America for not one presidential election, but for generations to come. And what we need to see is them become to be a reliable and trusted source. And what I would like to see is news networks like CNN, MSNBC, start bringing on Latinos and Latinas, young Latinos and Latinas, to talk about Latino and Latina issues. I don't want to hear it from anybody else's mouth. I want to hear it from our people because we have got, like I said earlier, the opportunity to create change, but only if we're given the seat at the table. And right now we haven't been, right? There's limited voices that speak for us on the national stage. And what we saw was which was really great is, for example, with Julian Castro's campaign, uh, Secretary Castro ran one of the most progressive campaigns, but I think it was all, over and over undercut by the lack of media attention. But though there was lack of media attention, as you saw, a lot of his policies were adopted by every single body else on that, on that stage. People were often saying, well, I agree with Senator Castro's proposal. I'm going to adopt that and then disregard him. And I'm gonna adopt this and disregard him. Stop disregarding us. Like you want you want our arts, you want our culture, start accepting our humanity as well and start giving us an opportunity and a platform as well. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think this is such a, this is such a crazy, the 2020 election is such a specific sort of place um, event right now. And I think um, part of it is, um, and I think that's gonna be interesting to see how Biden um, negotiates that because I agree with everything you know. Uh, and Antonio was talking about. I mean, the the Obama, the history of Obama's immigration policies, especially up until 2012, um, until DACA activists forced you know forced him to support um, to support DACA to, to to do an executive order. Until then, um, the policies around immigration have been particularly violent and damaging. So you know, it would be useful for someone like Biden to acknowledge that failure in a more significant way. And pledge something different, um, and I don't think he's done that in a really public. He's, he's had different gestures, but I don't think, in the same way with the crime bill, you know, I mean, there's been mass incarceration, you know, so so Biden carries a lot of baggage around those kinds of issues around Black and Brown communities as being a a, a solid liberal Democrat, but also somebody who has often pivoted to the center um, in the way that so many Democrats in the '90s did, which is on the bodies of Black and Brown people, and that's how they showed they were centrist was they did compromises that did a great deal of violence to our communities. And, and he fully sort of talked through, he wasn't the worst at that in terms of 90s politicians, but he definitely was one of those guys and he played a really important architectural role in some of those pieces of legislation. Um, so that's a challenge for him. Um, and I think, but I also think Donald Trump is, is, is an existential threat to literally the planet in our lives. And I think a lot of voters feel that right now. And so, and I think with COVID-19, it's only heightened the fact that people are literally dying because of the incompetence and corruption and dishonesty of this presidency. So, so I think in this case, I do actually think that the enthusiasm might be a, less, a lot less about Biden and a lot more about stopping Trump um, in this particular election. And, and I think that we actually should be pushing for people to see it that way. That in some ways, Biden is not a perfect person. I've been saying, I think of Biden as like a tourniquet to staunch to the blood. Like, you know, I think it's literally like, you just need to stop the, the killing. You need to, he's so incompetent. You need to just make this, um, you know, make this end. So, so I think that, you know, that's gonna be the challenge uh, for Biden. It's gonna be the challenge for any 
um, is, is going to be mobilizing Latinos, but I think a lot of it's going to be about mobilizing anti-Trump rhetoric and, and looking for somebody who's competent and decent and fundamentally able to. Um, I think we're gonna have to talk to people about the fact that voting isn't about falling in love. And I think that sometimes it is, and that's great, um, but voting is about expressing your political power and it's about um, having leverage over a candidate. And it's not just about feeling, you know, it's not like we're not on The Bachelor. You're not giving your rose to your favorite person. You are strategically deciding how you can save your own life. And that is what elections are for. And they are especially for them right now in the context of climate change and COVID. So I think we have to sort of reframe it that it's not really about what Biden can do. It's what do we as Latino voters need? What do we as communities of color need to survive into the future? And what we need is somebody we can manage to work with. So I think it has to be a different approach than this kind of um, love affair with the candidate or I won't, I'm gonna take them for granted. Or, you know, they're taking me for granted. So I, I'll show them, I won't vote. That's just not a logic that we can have right now. And I don't think that's the logic most voters have actually, but I do think sometimes with younger voters um, and voters who are more, um, um, off and on voters, they vote when they're inspired. And I think what needs to inspire us right now is the need to save our lives, um, not whether or not, because Joe Biden is a somewhat mediocre candidate, let's face it. Um, he was one of my least favorite uh, people I was the least enthusiastic about, but I'm all in for transforming this democracy out of the hellscape we're in right now. And I think that might be a really important part of our message going forward is it's not about Biden, it's about us. It's about our needs, it's about our communities. And, and in some ways, displacing Biden, making, he's not the center of this story right now. He's a tool that will help us save our lives. So I would like to think of him that way. Um, at least that's, that's my take. Great, thank you. Um, I'm actually having to call for my cell phone. So thank you um, for those technical issues that I ask for your patience. Um, please practice them now. Um, very insightful. So I want to make sure that we have time to get to our audience. Um, we have, let's see, we have a question from a viewer on YouTube. Um, Olivia asks, modifications and preparations are needed due to COVID-19. Voter registration forms and voter rules are only in English in my state. What system change or policy, policy changes are needed? And I'm going to expand on that question. Just what what do we think can, uh, what are some of the other issues that we need to be thinking about um, um, in getting the Latinx community to vote in light of, of the pandemic? Um, I, I'll start, I guess. Um, if, um, but I think that, I mean, I think that um, we obviously need legislation to make voter um, vote by mail much more common. And that's gonna be really difficult in the context of a Republican Senate right now. I mean, the Republican party has become the party of voter suppression um, and they've become a party that is that knows that if we make voting easy and available to all eligible voters, that they're gonna have a harder time winning because their message is aimed at a minority of voters. Um, and there's a long complicated history we can talk about with that, um, that history of voter suppression. But, but I think that um, we really do need to start focusing on protecting and securing the 2020 election. Um, and I think we need to be talking about this issue of the dangers of the future here. If, if we don't have um, access to the ballot, it's a really big issue. It's a really big concern in different states. Um, and so I think we have to sort of start, you know, there, there, are, there are pieces of legislation working on this issue, whether or not they're going to get passed. I think that may be one of the most important issues we mobilize around in the next few months is about free and fair elections that are accessible in the context of, of, of COVID-19 and really trying to make sure that everybody has access to the vote. That is, and, and we have, you know, we have a secure election. That was an issue before this election. I mean, before this, this, um, this pandemic, but now the issue is even, um, is even heightened. So I do think that um, we are gonna have to think really long and hard about this. And it's gonna be really hard in states with Republican governors because they are in no hurry to make voting easier or more available. Um, on the other hand, we saw what happened, you know, we saw what happened just in Wisconsin recently, where people had to choose between, you know, risking their lives and voting. And the fact that a Democratic judge won is, a, is, is testimony to people's um, enthusiasm out there, but it also speaks to the fact that this is an election that um, 
people, we need to be aware of the fact that the Republicans are willing to win this under any circumstances. They are willing to do this with Russian assistance. They are willing to do this by, by suppressing voting. They, they don't have any commitment to free and fair elections. We have a party that has lost that commitment. There might be individual Republicans who still believe in free and fair elections, but the party as a whole, led by Donald Trump, does not believe in free and fair elections. So that is incredibly dangerous. And we need to kind of keep our eye on that uh, going forward because um, that, is, that is a fact that we're facing with right now. And that's a really authoritarian um, turn in our politics that we should be talking a lot more about. So. Um, it seems that Antonio has dropped. So mm -hmm. for the time being, um, we'll move on to the next question. But I think that um, a lot of people in the democracy reform space are equally um, concerned to what length um, the Republicans will go to to suppress votes to make it not easy. Um, and, of course, and of course, like I mentioned, um, the health of our democracy really depends on those who can participate. And uh, I like to think that we should err on more participation. I'm going to go to our next question. It's from Monty Allen. He writes, who will be the most effective uh, spokespeople to mobilize Latina voters? Oh, um, I think that's a really, I think, I think some of the answers there are going to really vary by communities. You know, I think I think we should be thinking long and hard about who are the who are the influencers for you know young voters, for example, right? It might be you know Cardi B might be really critical in some spaces for some people, and you know, but you're gonna like my Thea is gonna be like who's she, right? So thinking about different populations of voters and thinking about different sort of influencers or folks that have a big impact, many of which could be Latino. I think if you think about Latinx sports figures, I think we need to pull out all the stops and get lots of different kinds of voices targeting different different populations. Um, uh, I don't think there's one person, you know, I don't think it's like just get Julian Castro or just get, you know, uh, Beto, you know, I think they need to be in the mix. But I think, you know, we wouldn't say who's the one white person who's going to really get the vote out. We would never assume that. So I think we have to realize that it's going to take a multiplicity of voices out there. Um, but I know we're getting close to ending too. So I, I did wanna note one thing that I think is really important that we haven't talked about, which is just that Latinos are really disempowered by the electoral college. And that really matters in the election. That really matters in 2020 for that. Not for the Senate, for the Senate, we need to go all out every state, do what we can do. But for the election, most of the swing states, Latinx voters are less or maybe often less than 5% of the vote, right? So in Michigan, when you think about the states that really are gonna matter in this election that are not safe states, um, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Virginia, Latinx voters are often either 5% or a little bit over 5% or under 5%, like 4%, 4.4% in those states. So, so it's really important that we are aware of the fact that in, we are really disempowered by the electoral college because close to 50% of Latinos are in, I mean, the majority of us are just in five states. California, Texas, New York, Florida, Arizona, right? So we are already, um, so in terms of the electoral college, um, Latinos are still um, really disproportionately um, impacted by that. And the other part of that is the electorate is much whiter than the population. So voters are still whiter than the overall American population. And older voters still turn out at much higher rates than the rest of us. Right. Oh, I guess, I mean, at this point, I'm probably one of those older voters, but older voters are really the ones who come out consistently. So, so we need to really deal with that Democrat. There's a sort of a demographic hill we have to climb. Um, but it's another reason why we have to get rid of the electoral college because it is really disadvantaging. It really has a disadvantage to, to Latinx voters. And we need to be aware of that um, going forward. Hey, Teresa, I just wanted to say I'm back on. This is Antonio. I'm sorry I had some technical difficulties, but I just caught the end of what Christina was saying, and absolutely, I, I echo all her sentiments. Fab, well, I'm, I'm glad that you could join us, and um, thanks for bearing with all the technical um, issues. I want to move on to um, another question from Oscar Echeverria. He writes, along with Joel, what other national orgs and or funders are working towards institutionalizing culturally relevant GOTV campaigns for Latinx communities. How about you start us off, uh, Antonio? 
Yeah, you know, I think so. I humbly say that I believe Jolt is really pioneering a lot of the work um, in, 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 in this new generational space, because historically there's been so many amazing organizations that have done such great work. Um, but we haven't seen this type of revitalization of the process since the Chicano movement. And so what we're seeing now is there's there's organizations like Charla, like Mi Gente, there's organizations like um, um, more more than anything, it's like in California and Arizona and New Mexico, um, Nevada, that are really hitting the ground running and trying to do um, outreach to Latinos in a way that hasn't happened in, in at least not in the last decade. And so and so we're really inspired by that. We're really uh, excited by that. But at Jolt, we're also utilizing models from groups like Fair Count and Fair Fight. That's the Stacey Abrams model over in Georgia, because we have to overlay some of their strategies with ours. Because for example, in Georgia, there's a lot of voter suppression that's running rampant, which is something that I wish we would have gotten a little bit more into because we talk about you know, Latinos don't vote, but we don't really talk about all the obstacles to get to the vote to the to the voting polls to begin with, right? And so, like, um, voter suppression is something that's running absolutely rampant. And in Georgia, we saw it cost Stacey Abrams the gubernatorial race, and that's something that's being duplicated here in the state of Texas. Last last February, we saw the Texas Secretary of State purge ninety or attempt to purge ninety thousand people off the voting rolls. Um, and so, and, and, and when we took the, li- when we took a look at that list of the people that he wanted to remove from the voting rolls, 90% of them were Hispanic surnames, right? And so it's like, okay, <laughs> what's happening here, right? And so, and it just so happened that it, that that voter purge came in the heels of one of the most, um, um, one of the biggest participatory uh, midterm elections in Texas, in modern Texas history, which was the 2018 better Beto O'Rourke Senate race, where we saw an increase. We saw a 500% increase among young uh, voters. We saw a 250% increase among Latino voters. So when what we're seeing here is that as we, as our communities of color start to rise up, and start to mobilize and participate, you will then see a domino effect of folks that will try to dim that power. And that comes in a a variety of ways, right? And and takes a variety of shapes to make sure that we don't end up getting to cast our ballot or that our ballot doesn't count. Um, And so we're excited by by other groups that are doing the work around around the the state. and, And we are constantly strategizing with other groups across the country to identify what are the best practices, um, what are the best strategies to really mobilize young people of color. Um, But I would encourage uh, uh, anybody who has an idea as to how we can connect and and engage more people to to please like uh, uh, make that known, make it known um, and, and, and connect with us. Joel is constantly taking ideas and input from our members or just the general public at info at joltx.org. Um, you can always shoot me a DM on Twitter um, or, or, or whatever it is, because we, we really do need that, that to honor the creative flow that is happening within this generation. Uh, we need to make sure that everybody that has um, a, 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 a proposal as to how to connect with particularly younger voters has a say in the process. Um, because it's going to be crucial. It's going to be crucial that we not just talk about uh, empowering Latino youth, but allowing them to actually lead. Thank you, Antonio. Cristina, do you have anything to add? Um, just real quick. I mean, yeah, I think the group, you know, Charla, Mi Gente, One Arizona, Mi Familia Vota, there's so many organizations right now that are coming up and um, groups like Jolt, I think that are really leading the way. And I would say that Um, I think one thing that's really powerful about this is it's not candidate centered, right? It's not about the candidates, it's about us, right? And Mm -hmm. what we need to do to become part of this process. And I think, but at the same time, we're seeing a lot more um, women of color, um, you know, running for office right now. So I think it's also this question of, again, us becoming the candidates and recognizing that we need to, um, um, because I think also the more you have folks from our, our different communities running for office, their election strategies are going to look different. So I think, you know, it's just this question of like, we, if we want this situation to change, we have to be the ones changing it. 
um, and we can't be waiting for um, inspiring candidates to come along. We have to become the inspiring candidates and we have to be organizing people on the ground every day. And, and that's what people are doing. And so I do think all those organizations um, speak to um, a, a different strategy and a different approach that I think is becoming much more prevalent right now, which I think is really important and really exciting um, and really necessary going forward. Thank you. And, and thanks for those that are still with us. We're pushing um, beyond our hour, but the conversation is so good. There's so much to talk about. Um, I want to get to another question from Megan um, Mink Francis. Hi, Professor Francis. Um, can the speaker say a bit more about the institutional constraints to Latinx political uh, participation beyond individual voters and political candidates? What types of structures should we pay attention to in order to build long-term power? And, and uh, Christina, you spoke a little bit about the disadvantage of the electoral college. Um, and I know that right now, um, a lot of organizations are struggling with things like, how are you gonna do um, a deep and meaningful voter registration um, for the Latinx community when we have to socially distance? We're in, in quite um, a different time. Um, what are both of your reflections of both of, of this moment, but also long-term, what needs to change in our democracy? Uh, that's a massive question. Um, <laughs> yeah. So much needs to change in our democracy. And... <laughs> um, but I mean I, I mean, I think I spoke to some of this already. Like I do think that we need to, um, that Latinos are um, remain a regionally concentrated population that is dispersing across the nation but um, in, in, you know, so we have these massive growth in places like the, the, you know, the U.S. South, for example, like the, you can look and see that Latino, um, you know, Latinx populations have grown by 200% over the last 10 years. Um, but they're not necessarily yet citizens. So you have, um, you know, so you have these challenges of the fact that you might have a large and growing population, but one that can't really politically defend itself through the ballot as easily as other populations might be able to. Um, and that will change over time as more and more folks become citizens as their children are born and get older. But, but those are the kinds of structural transfer, you know, transformations or changes that some of which are just demographic and take time. But some of the fact that you know, so many um, Latinx voters are in safe states or states where they've been um, taken for granted a lot of the time because they felt like they didn't either didn't want to mobilize them or, or didn't bother. Um, so there are those kinds of structural constraints that I think are, are somewhat um, just made up of the way the populations are located um, that, make it, that make it challenging. We're also, I mean, so about 33 million Latinos are eligible to vote right now. Um, about half of that population is, I mean, we are an extraordinarily young population. So um, something like, um, um, I was just looking for some of the numbers I have on this, like, um, um, we are um, one in 10 eligible voters right now overall are, are members of uh, Generation Z, but we are um, a much younger population and, and, it's, and it's hard to get young people to vote, period, right? It's hard to get young people to vote of any background. It's hard to get white college educated students at universities to vote, right? So it's extra hard when they are working class populations, when they are populations um, who are not, in, you know, not college educated, but are working full time with young families that move a lot, um, so our entire structure is not geared to helping young voters vote. It's really designed structurally to make it harder for them to vote. So, so we need to really think hard about um, the real lived experience of, of our voters and, and all the different kinds of structural constraints for those populations. And we need to like find solutions. I think one thing we should start really strategizing about is what does this COVID moment of being in place might make possible? Like Teresa brought up this fact that communities um, convince each other to vote, that you're convinced to vote because your mom talks to you or your aunt or your daughter or your son, you know. So a lot of times it's those conversations that impact that. Well, now we're kind of stuck together. Um, so is there a way to sort of say, well, while you're home right now, register to vote online. While you're home right now, fill out the census form, you know. A lot of time you're too busy and you're running around and you're doing something. You can't move right now very easily. You can't change apartments. Maybe you wish you could, but you can't. So can you fill out these forms at this moment? So I keep kind of hoping that we can think about this as like, we don't have the kind of face-to-face -face encounters that are possible usually, but we might have the fact that we're sort of stuck in these spaces just with our computers. What sort of um, possibilities for getting registered voters going? Like what sort of 
Should we be having like election Zoom parties or, you know, I just, I think we need the, the creativity of young um, and activist um, Latinx, you know, folks to be sort of proposing ways of thinking about how to mobilize in the COVID moment. Um, and how do you, and maybe that there are, maybe there are certain things about this moment that make certain kinds of ways of getting conversations happening or people filling out forms more possible because we're not all running around all the time. So I'd like us to start thinking that way because we need to be creative about this because there are lots of structural um, questions. I would actually like Frances to speak to the structural thing she was thinking of. I'm actually curious, um, but I don't know if we can turn on the speakers or not. Um, Professor Francis, you're unmuted. <laughs> no. You wanna no. put you on the spot well, I mean, here? Initially, I had asked that question actually right before Christina um, was talking about the Electoral College, because I think that's one of the issues, one of the structures that we don't talk about enough. Um, and I think a lot of people, and I mean, even my students, undergrad and graduate students, um, in so many ways, just think that that is what it is and that it can't be changed. And I really want to, especially in terms of a lot of my students, really push them to imagine a different type of political structure that works for them, right? And perhaps like right now, obviously in this 2020 election, we have to deal with the electoral college, but I hope in my lifetime that we actually do not anymore, right? And I think that, I think a lot of Christina's work is really important in thinking about democracy and thinking about political participation and how in so many ways the electoral college is undemocratic. Um, and just like, I know that we're really short on time, but I'm always really thinking about the way that the legal system, policing and law enforcement like operate, especially in communities of color, right? And so like, just really, especially, I mean, most of my work is around black politics um, and like organizing and black freedom movements, um, but you can't really talk about like building black political power, right? Without also talking about the way law enforcement and the way in which the state is coming um, and like stopping that type of work. And especially right about about how it relates to young people um, and the political mobilization around young people. So um, that's a, a tiny bit here, if I can just jump in this conversation um, about some of the structures that I think it's important to think about in terms of long-term, what it means to build political power. And I'm just really excited about this conversation and about the work of these two speakers here, um, because it's, you know, 2020 is here, but it's, it's, it's the long kind of the long-term vision here about how do we build like power in, in communities. Um, so I'm just really grateful for both of their work. So I'll end there. Well, it's gonna be like a mutual fan club. Like I love, I love, I love, um, I love um, this work. I mean, Francis, I mean, yeah, I mean, Megan's work is always like so amazing to me and, um, and just so important. And I just think that question of, we haven't talked about mass incarceration. And I think um, also thinking about the fact that, you know, we always, I always tell my students, remind them like Latino's not a race. Right, you can be white and Latino, you can be mestizo, you can be Afro-Latino. Um, so Afro-Latinx population. So the, the questions of carcerality and mass incarceration, um, not only are they, not only are there solidarity and coalitional possibilities there, but they're actually the same communities. Like black communities are Latinx communities, Latinx communities are black communities. So so no, you know, you know, um, the connections across around indigeneity, like those are those are all the kinds of um, overlapping communities that we're a part of. And so I think, I think just, you know, just to, just to um, sort of build on Megan's point, I think it's just really important to keep that in mind because that again is gonna be so key around um, mobilizing um, our communities. Antonio, did you have anything to add? Um, I know that Joel is probably pivoting their strategy of how to adapt to, to this time um, of COVID. Um, what exactly, how are you going to get the work done in reaching voters or new voters? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. And so uh, really quick, before I, I dive into answering your question, I just want to like, I want to add something to the end of that conversation that was so great between uh, Professor Frances um, and Christina is that, okay, grand scheme here, big picture, step back and recognize that democracy in America was made for white land owning men to vote. It was not for women to vote. It was not for non-land owning people to vote. It was not for black people to vote. It was not for anybody else, but white land owning men, right? And so when we recognize that the infrastructure, the foundation of this democracy was established on top of that, and we have built off of that, we have to recognize that the instruct, the inception of democracy was not entire, that was not intended for us to participate. And we have been making ourselves part of the process throughout generations, but it's not done yet. That process hasn't been finished. And so we need to continue to break down the barriers that seek to limit our futures. And that's gonna come within this generation and then within the next generation. And you know, 
Christina talked about how powerful it will be once Texas finally goes blue and like every election cycle, it's like, is Texas gonna go blue this year or whatever? And the thing is that what we need to recognize is gonna take year round organizing, multiple cycles of year round organizing and investment, intentional investment in low income communities and communities of color that have been left out, that have been undereducated on the subject matters and breaking down the barriers like voter ID, voter suppression, that tried to limit us. Here in the state of Texas, we're one of the only states in the country that still does not have online voter registration. And so when you're dealing with millennials, which is who we speak to, Gen Sears and millennials, and we tell them, by the way, you got to fill this out and you got to put it in the mailbox. And people are like, what's a mailbox? <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like the DMs, what are you talking about? And so, you know, and so you have to really work through all these challenges. And the reason that Texas has not modernized its process is because it's not exponential or beneficial to folks who are currently in power. If they allow online voter registration for an entire new generation that thinks incredibly more progressively than the current leaders of the state, you will transform the entire state's po po political face. And so we are seeing that battle wage on. And so, you know, in the, in the last couple of weeks, Jolt has been forced with, um, with this challenge of COVID-19 and in, in a state that it was already difficult to, mar to, to, to engage and, and register folks to vote, it became even more difficult because now we're sheltered in place, we're quarantined, we can't go out and do this physical one-on-one -on -one on site voter registration. And so we did two things, one, we created a, uh, a, a public pressure campaign to demand that we move towards mo uh, uh, mail-in voting, right? Mail-in voting. We just had a massive victory with the judge ruling in our favor last Friday. So as of week from uh, uh, last week, uh, we can now do mail-in voting in the state of Texas, though that litigation is going to continue. The Texas uh, Attorney General Ken Paxton, who I have to say is an indict, is, has been indicted himself and has his own criminal record, but nonetheless is the Texas Attorney General, um, has said that he will then follow suit with, uh, with legal action against any organization that actually promotes mail by ballot. And so now there's an, a, an additional threat from the Texas Attorney General to make sure that organizations like ours do not promote that. And so we're anticipating additional lit, uh, litigation on this on this subject matter. But what, what, what we're happy about is to know that there was a judge in the state that recognized that this makes sense. Why will we put people in jeopardy when we can just mail in the ballot, right? But we see we also have a president of the United States who says that this only perpetuates uh, voter fraud. So here we are in this uh, awkward moment in political history where we're trying to make sure that people have access to the ballot box and it's just being limited by those in power when we call ourselves a democracy. It's interesting. Number two is we called for um, uh, online voter registration to be enacted. I mean, modernizing the process in Texas is crucial. We have now millennials have outnumbered baby boomers. They are the largest eligible voting bloc in the country. And in Texas, they're brown and black and ready to vote. And we need to make sure that we are giving them the opportunity to do just that. And that means speaking to a digital generation in a language that they understand. That means facilitating the process in a way that is easily digestible. And um, that's what we're also pushing for is a, a, for pushing for our state officials to allow um, online voter registration. What we're doing in the meantime is there's a program called registertovote.org and we're partnering with Register to Vote. Register to Vote allows you to fill out your online voter registration and then they mail you the form already pre-filled with an envelope and a stamp. All you have to do is sign it and mail it back. Um, and so we're, we're partnering with them to mitigate this in the meantime, right? And so we're trying to allow people to register in that way. They still have to have a physical copy and sign it, but it's a little bit more a simplified uh, process altogether. Um, aside from that, uh, Christina's absolutely right. What we've been doing is doing online virtual meetups, virtual volunteer hours, virtual textatons, vir virtual phone bankings, so that we're continuing to engage our members. Jolt is fortunate to count with 15,000 members across the state. We have almost 30 student chapters at college campuses from El Paso to Dallas and everywhere in between, covering as much of the state as we possibly can, but Texas is massive. And so we have ambitious goals to continue to expand our, our presence across the, the state. Um, 
and engaging these young uh, college students to maximize the peer, the, the pressure campaigns, public pressure campaigns um, through virtual rallies, virtual communications, and virtual volunteer hours. We've had a lot of success. It seems like students are at home bored, and so they're happy to join a virtual <laughs> rally, particularly when it pertains to subject matters that affects them directly. And so in this year, we'll be addressing more of climate change related issues, as well as college affordability issues, to make sure that we continue to break down those barriers um, uh, for the long haul as well. Thank you. So um, I'm going to start trying to wrap up, but I cannot let this conversation end without us talking a little bit about the 28% of Latinx voters that supported Donald Trump in 2016. Um, can, you guys, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. You broke up a little bit. Uh, but Zoom we is. Zoom was was um, talking to me. Um, can we can we have some reflections as to do we think that the the Trump Latinx voter is going to turn out and support um, a, a lot of his um, enthusiasm was driven by a strong economy. This pandemic has shifted um, a lot of things. Do we think that? Um, is he actively reaching out to Latinx voters? Is, do you think that they'll stay loyal? Do you think that they'll show up? What are some of your reflections around that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that it's gonna be really interesting because um, he, had a, he had a really long run of good luck economically um, up until COVID um, in terms of um, he, he had, he inherited the Obama economy and he sort of, you know, it, it didn't, you know, he gave a massive tax cut um, and so things, you know, things were going fairly well. So I do think that now it will be interesting to see if after four years, uh, Latino conservatives will look and say, um, you know, this is still my guy. Um, I think a lot of them will. I think that, um, I think that there's about 25% of the Latino vote that is conservative, period. They're Republicans. They're ideologically committed to conservatism for a variety of reasons. Um, and so um, it is a larger percentage than African-American conservatives. Um, there's a really important gender gap that's really important there. Something like 73% of Latinas are pretty strong Democrats. I mean, 70, yeah, 73% um, um, versus um, there's a, you can, you know, there's more um, uh, conservatism among Latino men. So the gender gap there is something to consider. Um, but I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's related to a larger question of, um, of ideology and also, I mean, for example, 50% or so of the border patrol now is made up of Latinx border patrol agents. So, so this is one of these interesting questions around uh, mass incarceration and detention and deportation. A lot of people who work in the carceral system are people of color. So one thing we have to sort of think about is the way that we are both police and population, right? And, and there's a lot of reasons for that, right? There's a lot of people in Texas, you know, those, are, those jobs are one of the few places where you can actually get a pension and middle-class payment, you know, middle class sort of lifestyle coming out of it. So, so there's a lot of reasons why people might get drawn into that. And not all, I'm not saying every Border Patrol agent is voting in a conservative way, but I'm just pointing to the fact that there are complicated stories of how um, multicultural conservatism is playing out right now. Um, and I think we have to get our heads around it rather than just thinking it's, it's um, false consciousness. I might disagree with it and think it's wrong, but they actually, have a different set of um, politics and interests. And some of those people are win overable. And some of those people, um, I think like, you know, like a lot of kind of politics that we don't agree with, they have to be defeated um, at the ballot box. Um, so I think we have to um, acknowledge the fact that, you know, one thing I think a lot about is what's gonna happen to third and fourth generation Latinx voters, right? I think that population is a really interesting one to think about. And I, I think of that in my own family because I'm, I'm, my family has been here for generations on my mother's side and about three or four generations on my dad's side. And I see, and they're both one of six, and I see a really interesting ideological range in my own family. I see, I see some folks who are married to people who are recent immigrants and have a really strong sense of their Latinidad and Mexican identity who are appalled by some of the politics. And I have other you know, um, family members who are very conservative and they, they, they actually echo white working class conservatives, non-college -edu non educated um, you know, conservatives. Um, and they are not dissimilar and they don't 
feel connected to immigrants and they've never been to Mexico except for maybe on a booze cruise on a cruise ship, right? So, so and there's really diverse Spanish language acquisition in the family, right? A lot of folks who are monolingual pretty much, they know a little Spanish, but they're English speakers, right? So there's a lot of diversity. And I think thinking about who the conservative segments of our community are is something to think about. And I think trying, we need to actually dig into the details of who is being drawn to conservatism in our communities and who isn't. And, and I think there's gonna be a lot of really interesting stories there around rural, around national origin group, Right, I, I know a lot more about Mexican American politics in California and Texas, but Venezuelan communities, Cuban communities, Nicaraguan communities, you know, all these communities that have been dealing with um, the different kind of political unrest in their own communities and their own sense of ideological um, history around socialism and their, their thoughts around that and how they think of it as related to maybe authoritarian politics versus the younger generation who don't feel that way. So we're gonna have to really dig into that. But I mean, if you look at a Trump rally in the Southwest, in New Mexico, in Texas, you see a goodish number of, of Latinx folks there. And that is something we can't ignore or uh, wish away. We have to actually do research on them and figure out who they are and what they're doing. And, um, and I think that's been something that has been uncomfortable to do because we wanna think of ourselves as a progressive community and we are on the whole, but there's this big portion. It's like white women dealing with, white women aren't all feminists, right? We knew that, we knew that before, but, but a lot of white women are, are conservatives. And, um, and so we have to think about these populations um, in, in more nuanced ways is, is I guess my point. Antonio, do you wanna have the last word on this? Yeah, so you know, your question was, do we think that the Trump electorate is basically still intact and are they gonna come out? Absolutely. Right. And I think as we see this uncertainty of people of color coming out, you bet your bottom dollar that conservatives are going to come out and vote like you've never seen before in unprecedented numbers, because this is their last grasp at power. They know that it's on the line and they know that if they don't come out, they're going to lose. And so you will see a, so I think you'll see unprecedented voter, voter turnout come November and it'll be from both sides. It'll be from both sides and it'll be passion driven. It's going Going to be, I think we need to mentally prepare ourselves for a very nasty electoral uh, general election. Um, and I think it'll do a lot of damage to our democracy, to our, to our, you know, it's not going to unite our country at all. I think the division will only grow, unfortunately. But that's just the reality of where it is. And that's the reality of electing a divisive president. That's the reality of uh, electing a administration that seeks to divide and conquer, right? And, you know, going back to um, to Christina's point earlier about uh, the unity of black and brown folks, uh, it's crucial. We are both under attack by the same oppressor. And what we're seeing here is with this administration, there's, you know, they're attacking LGBTQ rights, they're attacking uh, black rights, Latino rights, you know, you name it, they're attacking it, women's rights, etc. So you're seeing a lot of fires. And there are sections of groups, people that are really passionate about women's rights, people that are really passionate about, uh, you know, uh, incarceration, people that are really passionate about LGBTQ rights. They're all activating themselves, trying to put out their own fire. But what we need to realize is that it's the same fire, right? And we need to come together and utilize that, our, our a, a, a united voice to try to put this out because they've got us running left and right and up and down. And so we need to make sure that we do a better job at really unifying our country through um, through our uh, th these organizing groups that are actively trying to put out these flames. Um, the other thing is, um, will Latinos continue to vote for conservatives? Absolutely. I mean, we talked about Latinos not being monolithic. And a lot of folks do identify with anti-LGBTQ, anti-abortion um, sentiments. And, and, and those tend to be conservative platforms. And so if the party, I, I honestly think that if the Republicans were a little bit uh, more intentional, intentional about courting Latinos, they would probably get a mass majority of Latino voters because a lot of their messaging is geared towards issues that align with old traditional Latino mindsets. And so, but what I do have good news um, in, our, in, our <laughs> in our We Are Texas report, we surveyed young Latinos. And in that we recognize that the younger electorate is incredibly progressive. 
The issues that they care about, like I mentioned, healthcare for all, immigration reform, racial equity, climate change, gun safety, these are progressive issues, right? And so what you'll see is that there's a generational divide and the growing electorate, it's incredibly progressive. And that's who will be the future political face of this country. And so I think it's just um, a matter of starting to build the infrastructure to catapult this, this young growing electorate into power. And like Christina mentioned, it starts by running for office. It starts by us believing that we are the answer to the problems. It's we got to stop looking to the left and stop looking to the right for the solutions. We got to start looking within ourselves, step up and fill that void. And I also think largely speaking, this two party system is not working for America. I mean, people now for the past couple of election cycles, people are having to vote for the lesser of two evils. A lot of people feel like, well, crap, I'm out of options. What do I do? These are my two options. This two-party system, I think there, I think the, the, the days are numbered in, in, in the two-party system in America. If, and, and, if, 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 and if the decision comes down to young people who will end up choosing whether um, they will remain in a two-party system, I think that you will see a drastic change in the next decade um, away from a two-party system. But in order for that to happen, money will play a pivotal role. And the way that money is distributed amongst the DNC and the RNC will be crucial in whether the party remains, what party remains in power and how it is distributed. And if we look at um, Latin American countries where there is, I mean, sometimes even hundreds of parties and like a lots, lots and lots of candidates that run for political office and like the highest office, like for president, you will see that um, it's often led by issued focus campaigns and issued focus voters that say, no, we want to take the country in a completely radical different way. And we're going to all galvanize behind this. I think young people in America have the opportunity to do that in this, in this country, but have been fearful because they don't think they have the infrastructure or the funding that they need to win. But I think that soon they will have the numbers to make it happen. And, you know, similar to what's happening in the UK, and I mean, not completely alike, but similar to like Meghan and uh, Henry detaching from uh, the royal family, stripping and breaking away the royal family, that could very well happen to America in a different way. And it'll be by our political parties beginning to detach and, and detach away from this two party system mentality. I know that was a lot. I took you like 20 years into the future. Sorry. <laughs> Did we lose Teresa? Oh no. That's a good conversation. Okay. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, there yeah, you are. All right. There I am. Um, with that note, on that note, with the Harry and Megan reference, um, I think that is a fun way to wrap this up. I had um, so much fun just chatting with you about something that I feel so deeply about. Um, and I, I wanna thank you, Cristina and Antonio for, for joining us. And I feel like there's a future conversation that we need to have um, after the election and we can unpack a lot of what we learned. Um, talk again uh, will be posted on the Ash Center website later viewing. And if you enjoy this conversation and want to learn more about our events, research, or resources, please follow us at, at Harvard Ash on Twitter. And lastly, I want to thank you, the audience, um, for your great questions and for your patience with our technology and just overall interest in how we're going to power build for the Latino community. Thanks again, everyone, and take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.